about his life. And if I can ask you, just in a sec, can you uh, give me one phrase uh, from his life, Kurchik's life, which was most striking for you? Just in one phrase or once, or, or just two words or one word. What was most surprising, striking, which you never heard of and which made you feel like, oh my God, what a person? What about the children? Children. What about right. children? Yeah, what about the children? Okay. Anything else which you can recall? Or just just whatever comes to your mind right away. Jane? It wasn't a surprise, but it was reinforced as love the child. Love. Okay. Not the child, but the child. Okay. Okay. Ronald? Just the love all children rather than your child. Okay. Love all children, not your own. Okay. Ellis? Uh, respect the children, not and see them as people, not possessions. Not possessions. Okay. Claire? <clears throat> his recognition of children as people and of themselves in that moment. Okay, okay. Judith? The foreigners? As foreigners, okay. Children as foreigners in this world. Anyone else? Judith? Um, his compassion. And what stands out for me is when he's looking at the SS agent you're talking about out the window. Before. Yeah, soldier. Just soldier. soldier. Yeah. yeah. And trying to think about what he was like as a child. Yeah, I'm trying to find Okay, Sigmund? Um, I like that he was human. Human. Um, like, uh, he has done great things, but at the same time, there's a recognition that there's also other things in his life. Like, you know, um, like when you were talking about he was never married. Um, and, you know, and, and you said, like, maybe she, he just never found a partner who could share the same vision. Yeah. Or the, when he had struggles, I think. That's what I kind of, like, it grounds him as a human being rather than someone who is... Um, not a monument. Yeah. Not, not a monument. A human being. Okay, anyone else? I'm so sorry. Remind me of your name. Teza. Teza, yeah. Um, I thought it's really interesting that he went, like, he, he very much found his passion in children and went through, like, wanting to be a writer and a doctor and then just fully dedicated Perfect. You connect with today. <laughs> okay. We'll stop there. Okay. So, um, if you read his words about death uh, on, on the screen. No, no. It's, it's here, please. It's here. Oh, on the screen. It's not the end. It's actually another life. So this another life we are going to talk about today. I thought it would be good to start with that, although it's death, but in his case. You know, I, I was always thinking about what's left after the person is gone. For many people, it's just the dash between the date of birth and the date of death on the gravestone. But there are some lucky ones, like Porchuk, when we're not talking about the dash, or many dashes, or many periods. We're talking about the huge impact on humanity. And such are just real, real, real people in many, many millions. So um, UNESCO called the 2012 the year of Korchuk. How many have their names attached to the year? Hardly. Hardly. And what I want to bring to you today is how many hats can a person wear? Physically, one. Emotionally and psychologically, many, many. And some of them we already spoke about, some we just touched upon, some we didn't even mention. So we will try to talk about a few today. He was a doctor by training, we mentioned it. 
And we also mentioned he felt he betrayed pediatrics because that was his passion. He knew he was making a difference in children's lives, but then he made his choice. He became a radio journalist, but he never betrayed children because of that. He was a writer. He wrote about 20 books. He wrote over a thousand texts all in all. He was a researcher, and we'll talk about it today. He was a teacher of young teachers or teachers to be, which I'm going to talk about as well, which is fascinating for me as this is my career, and I could never ever, frankly, find anyone who would be as talented and as unpredicted as Korchev was. And that's probably one of his best impacts on teachers. He was an innovating many, many things. But at the same time, he never spoke about himself. I am innovator, did this and that. No, he was extremely humble. And he spoke in a quiet voice, which I need to learn. You know, mm -hmm. because I, I always thought the teaching the classroom should be present, clearly present. And this present presence comes uh, with the voice as well. Secret, what would you say as a teacher? Your Else, voice. The voice. I mean, what do you think about the voice? He spoke in a very quiet voice, almost whisper. Well, as a high school teacher, there's times when you actually want their attention, sometimes you need to use the quiet voice because they get used to the loud voices all the time. Excellent. But, but when you start using the quiet voice, like sometimes like I, I just whisper in the front and they start, especially when they're noisy. When they and it gets quiet in the yeah. room. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So he was a care provider, not in the sense we understand it today, but in a much broader sense. And he was definitely a psychologist. He was also and always a child's advocate in every profession he used. He was a peacemaker. And he was an interpreter for the world of children, for the world of adults. I'm not sure you know this, but I've been in these shoes. So when you see uh, a synchronic interpreter in some big meetings, there's a person in the booth sitting and he's synchronically translating. Do you know how it works? It's half an hour and then he has half an hour break because it's an extremely, extremely stressful job. And many of them get a disease which is a serious mental disease because this is a split of personality. You listen in, you listen to a person speaking, for example, in English, but you translate into Polish. And you have to be present, very clearly present, immediately into realities, which is very difficult. And the disease is called schizophrenia. Korczak was the interpreter of the children's world to the world of adults without any breaks, and without schizophrenia, and without real good pain. Isn't it brilliant? If you compare it to the work and of breaks, good lunch, good dinner, water, and good salary. Nothing of the kind but real professional work. Now, um, a couple of just information he was a radio showman, and it was known as Old Doctor Shows, and these are the years when he worked as a radio showman, from 34 to 36, every week. And how it worked, that was Old Doctor giving advice to parents, and as I said, his name, his real name was never known. And People who knew him and his voice would say, oh, that's Janusz Korczak. And because of that, hardly anyone knew that was a Jewish doctor. And that was a revelation for many people. And then there was a huge break, not because of him, 
for two years, and then it was uh, back uh, on air for a year, and that was the year immediately before the war. Remember September 1939? That's the Second World War started in Poland. And that last year, he was practically preparing adults and children understanding that the war is was inevitable, so he was preparing emotionally and psychologically. Korchik was a writer. If you look at this, I, I found this photo today. As I said, it's good to get up early in the morning. So I was looking for that. These are actual glasses of Korchik. He left them on the desk before they were deported and uh, Niverli, his uh, secretary, picked them up after he came to the vacant building and, uh, and they're preserved. They're in Wasser, they're shown, they, they're real. So these are the glasses he was choosing and using. So here I'm showing you, as you probably remember, I hope, um, he wrote for both adults and children. So the most famous is one of the books which you have now in your possession, How to Love a Child. And I'm showing you also the Ghetto Diary. This is one of the books which I consider extremely powerful because he didn't write it for publication. He just made notes. And these notes, fortunately, were preserved and were published afterwards. They're not a literary masterpiece, but they are a document which shows the wealth and the depth of the tragedy which happened. Uh, I can compare only to one document which I want to share with you because you probably would never have a chance to say to yourselves. Um, you probably know about Leningrad's siege. Do you know that during the Second World War, Leningrad was in the circle of Nazi troops for over 300 days. So it's called a siege. So the city was absolutely blocked by the Nazis. And what happens inside such a city? Hunger. People die not because they are murdered or shot, but because they die of hunger. And first to go are usually children, women, most vulnerable. So I don't remember the exact number, and I don't want to give you wrong numbers, but it's definitely over half a million people died of hunger. Stalin decided not to let Leningrad go, not to be occupied by Nazis. So Nazis never really were downtown Leningrad, but they did the worst. They kept it in the blockade. And because of that, people were dying. So on the cemetery, which is called Piskarovsky Cemetery, where all the civilians are buried, there's a small museum. And this museum has artifacts of those who perished, but some facts are kept there. So there, there are 10 notes from a diary of a little girl, 10 years old, and I saw that. It was many, many years ago, and to this day, I remember the feeling. So these are pages from a small, no, no, I'm not showing that. Uh, these are pages from a small notepad. On, on each page, there's one sentence and a date. And, and it goes like this. I don't remember the exact dates, but it doesn't matter. It goes like this, January 20th, my aunt died. January 21st, my mom died. January, January 22nd, my brother died. And it goes on like this. And the last note is, today I remained alone, period. That's it. So I'm thinking uh, diaries like this, artifacts like this, that is probably the most powerful weapon against Nazism today. When you see a, a child's diary which tells
tells you, I'm absolutely an orphan today. Why? Because no one took care of my family, of me. People ate people at that time. Dead bodies were everywhere in the streets because no one had energy and enough power to actually bury dead people. And when the child writes, today I'm left alone. So what would be the next note if somebody found her? Of course, a dead body. So the portrait's diary, I think, is one of the most powerful documents against Nazism and neo-Nazis, which is happening today, as you know, I'm sure. When people say Holocaust did not happen in the history, and Nazis were, in fact, nice people, quite educated, which is, again, a question about whether education brings morality together, probably. Korchak also wrote children's books, and we spoke about it. So King Man the First is the one on the right here. That's the original uh, picture, if I'm not mistaken. And Korchak the Wizard is practically Harry Potter, but in a better version. Only Harry Potter is uh, everybody knowing it, and uh, Kind of the wizard is kind of not known. I would strongly recommend it, especially if you work in, in classrooms where you work with children who would understand, I would say, teenagers. Uh, that's a great book for reading. <clears throat> Kochik was a researcher. And let's read what he is saying. I have the mind of a researcher, not an inventor. To study in order to know, no. To study in order to know more? No. I think it is to study to ask more and more questions. And frankly, it's one of my dreams and hopes that every researcher at the end of the research paper would actually put a question. How many proud of themselves people we have among researchers who would say they did do a breakthrough in their field and this is it and there's a period at the end. How about a question mark? That's what she did. And how about a question mark for medical professionals and for teachers? And for everyone because there's a never ending process of knowing. And as you remember that famous phrase, the more I know, the more I understand, I know next to nothing, nothing, right? So this I put here together, and that's one of my, and I put it here, that's one of my favorite phrases from him, the first one. What a fever, a cough, a nausea is for a physician, so a smile, a tear, or a blush should be for an educator. Not a single symptom lacks significance. When you as a nurse come to the child who is sick, the way the child looks at you, right? The way the child coughs or smiles or not smiles or looks sad or frightened, or anything else. There are so many symptoms. And uh, the children who were in charge of, of courtship, they were extremely lucky because the combination of a trained medical doctor and a teacher and an educator, that's the best of two worlds. How many mistakes current teachers wouldn't have done if they had the medical knowledge? How many mistakes they wouldn't have done if they knew that if the child cannot listen to very carefully, 
or jumps in the seat or asks to go out to the restroom. It doesn't mean anything else, but there is a physical problem. There's a problem with his or her health. And it's not mischief. It's not bad behavior. It's not disrespect. He's talking about observations, and he's saying you need, as a teacher, observe the individual child, but how to do it? Many young teachers especially tell me, well, you know, I have the class full of kids. How can I observe each child? Can you share, any of you? How can you see each child in a group? Is it, in fact, possible? If you stand at the beginning of class in front of the door and welcome the child, mm -hmm. then you see who is feeling good that day or who is not. Excellent. In the morning, before before the class starts. How else? Jacqueline, I had a grade seven teacher who did a concept called the open classroom and he would schedule a meeting with each of us every week, not every day, but every week, um, to just Perfect. And there's 30 of us. Perfect. Any, anything else? Okay. So I remember my first class as a teaching training. I was standing like this. I was holding to the desk. I was so nervous. So I was holding it like this. And the whole, just during the whole class, for 45 minutes, I was standing like that. So, I managed to do what I planned to do, and the teacher who was observing me, uh, my mentor, and she was old, she was probably 50 at the time, so, <clears throat> yeah, and at the end, uh, when we discussed the class, she said, you know, everything was good, but don't you feel your fingers are probably aching now? <laughs> I said, what, what do you mean? She said, well, look at your fingers. <laughs> and they were kind of white, bluish. And then I realized I was so nervous, I never made a step forward. Not because I was afraid of them, but it's just, you know, you hold to this. But I learned something during my life. So he's talking about children in many different ways, as you know, and I'm not going to bring all of them. But this one brings us back to this whole idea of a child is an actor. I'll give you half a minute. Think of your own child or your students who could be so different in very different situations. Do you want to share? Jacqueline, do you want to share? Sure. Um, so my son, when he goes into new settings, he's so quiet and observant. And he might not say a single word, and he just likes to look and watch. But once he gets to know people, he talks nonstop, and he dances, and he's just like, he's a ham. He likes to be the center of attention. People are like, who is this child? Yeah. Um, I know for him, when he goes to daycare, he's very, very um, well behaved, and he mm -hmm. follows all the rules, and he gets these glowing reports, and then when he comes home, he just, like, crazy is yeah. not, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, so, uh, I'm, Jane, you want to share? Well, one of my favorite ones is when my daughter was about 18 months old or so, and, uh, I was leaving for work, and she was with the person who was going to look after her. And when I would leave the table to go to work, she would completely fall apart. She would cry. Very hard to leave her. But the way the house was, I came here, and then I went around a corner to put on my shoes. So I disappeared from sight. 
And the moment I disappeared from sight, she switched she off and crying. <laughs> so that me, taught me a fabulous lesson because both moments were completely sincere. And it was about, I think, it's about the child absolutely lives in the present. Yeah, yeah. Once I was gone, I was gone. She dealt with it. She carried on. So I learned not to prolong the, the saying goodbyes because I was, I was the one who was making it. Sure. She was sure. not, and I think that I think kids do that all the time. I mean, it's it's interesting. I don't think it's a mask. I mean, I think we can interpret it as a mask. No, definitely not a mask they put on no. intentionally. This is something they do not intentionally, but. For an adult, it's very difficult to switch like that, yeah. right? We lose the capacity. But they switch like in a second. And you see a, a totally different personality in a second, right? So this I want to bring to mm. you because when I first learned about it, I was thrilled that this is really something and someone who did it. So <clears throat> here's the situation. First, Korchuk lacked a uh, staff, and he was thinking about how to bring more staff members. And then he came up with a great idea, uh, because the house, the building itself was huge. So he said that he would give uh, a bed and uh, breakfast, if you wish, yes, so bed, so boarding capacity for young students from Bursa. Bursa was a teacher's seminary at the time. And, um, and they had to work part-time as um, support staff at the boarding school, so at the office. So it was good for both. But he wanted to teach them how, how to work. And um, as as it happened again and again, more students, and he became kind of what we would call a junk professor now. So he was there in the orphanage, and they would come to him as groups, and they would learn from him. So his once, what happened? He came into the room like this. The students were preparing to listen. He was extremely famous. And the idea of is teaching would bring many people from all over Warsaw to listen to a legendary educator. And here comes, just imagine this, and here comes an educator holding to the hand of a little boy, six years old. They come in together, and the uh, person who, let's say, assistant, yeah, um, greets him, and Korchik says something quietly to the assistant, and the assistant announces, we all go to X-ray medical room. Right? And the students are thinking, what is that? Yeah, 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 the assistant says, take everything with you, we are going to that room. To do what? To have a lecture. Why an X-ray room? So they all come in, it's a small room, they all sit down here. Korchuk brings the little boy behind the screen, asks him to take off his shirt, puts him be behind the screen, and starts the machine. And they see the kid is frightened because the situation is also stressful for him. And they see the beating of the heart. And it happened for a minute. Korchuk puts the shirt back on the kid and says to the students, remember how the heart of a frightened kid beats. And whenever you want to scold or start doing something bad to a child, remember how the frightened heart of a child looks like. And then he says, the lecture is over. He takes the kid and he leaves the room. How about that much? I'm sure it stayed with them forever. 
Because what more impressive and powerful can you imagine? You see the actual product video. You would never imagine anything like this in the teacher's university. I, I weren't trained teachers all my life. I could never think of bringing my students into the x-ray room and show them something like this. That's what courtship was. Do you think every person at the time, every educator would do it? No. No, of course not. That's that's because he was so exceptional, and that's how he was teaching. By his own example, and also uh, by incredible ideas he had. But it's not because he was sitting at home thinking, how should I do it to show them? No, it came naturally, because if the level of empathy is so which is a very rare and very much in demand quality in anyone who is within the field of health information. I spoke with doctors who are hematologists, who are in children's hospitals, who work with children who are dying, and I see their stern faces like no emotions, and they told me, I cannot take each child into my heart. It would be too much. There are too many children dying. There are too many sick children. I need to have a distance. I'm not judging. I know each person is different. And if they're doing their job in a quality way, that's okay. But I'm thinking, if you bring into your profession your heart as well, I tend to think whatever muscle you exercise, it becomes stronger and bigger. The heart is also a muscle. And if you exercise this muscle with empathy, it can embrace as many kids as necessary. I tend to think a medical doctor, especially a pediatrician, or any medical professional without a heart should look for another job. Would you agree? Right? And uh, the same about teachers, of course, and anyone who works with kids. But this whole thing, because it's a, a non-stop discussion, we cannot bring everyone into our hearts because it's too much. But how about exercising this capacity and the muscle? The same about the brain. The moment we stop thinking and start judging, the brain gets, you know, shrunk. The ability to think diminishes. That's why they say when people are old, they need to do puzzles, they need to do different things to exercise. So as professionals, and not still old, I'm embracing myself, um, we need to exercise all these capacitors. But among all of them, I think the heart is the most So, <clears throat> I wanted to leave you with this, let us demand respect, but I thought we had enough of that. But I thought of this quote, which is not known, is absolutely incredible. Now, if you read it carefully, especially on July 4th, the state requires patriotism. The church requires dogmatic faith. The school wants repetition of dubious truths. And the parents wants obedience. What kind of product can we expect? People with mediocre I was, when I first read, I thought, wow, 
maybe it's only about many years ago, and then I read it again. Does it apply to today? No. I'm afraid it's kind of universal. So let's remember this, because I, I promise I'll put it on canvas and we'll make it work so you'll help. But uh, what I'm thinking is uh, try to remember that, because every institution, and family included, has its own rules and its own imposition on the child. How many can a child endure? How much can a child take into himself or herself? No wonder they resist. So, uh, talking about educational innovations, practically each of them, we would have a separate lecture next, next week, and we would have a great guy from Poland, from Wasek, who is a Karczakian, who is a researcher. We will have a wonderful teacher from Pennsylvania, from the U.S., who does children's court in his school. So I'm not going to talk about that. I just wanted to bring it together for you to see that it was a real children's republic with its own parliament, its own court, its own flag, its own mailbox where children who didn't want to protest openly would put a letter and the letter could be anonymous and in this letter they could express themselves and they're being I'm not happy with this or that and that was also taken care of. So that was a real children's democracy which we never achieved in any country on earth so far. Uh, this is a woman who literally was his shadow and who during many times when he was at war and he was in four wars, she was the one who was running the opponent. If you look at the dates of uh, birth and death, when I wrote, uh, when I read about her before, many times, I thought she was extremely old. I, I seriously thought she was much older than he was. Now let's count. 56. She was gone together with the orphanage, of course, in Treblinka. She was the one who was the last in that procession of children. Korczyk was leading the kids. She was the very last helping those who couldn't walk past. Stefa Dolchinska is from a very wealthy Jewish family who chose to be what she chose to be. She definitely loved Korczyk as a woman. They never, as is known, uh, they never had an affair. He didn't have interest in her as in a woman. And as you see, she was not a striking beauty. But for 200 kids at a time, and during years, thousands of children, she was their mother. For a long time, until she turned 42, she was Miss Stefa. And then, one day, overnight, in the morning, she announced, as I am a woman of a certain age, and I have all of you as children, from this day on, you call me mother. So, in, in Polish, I think it's Pani, yeah, Pani Stefa. So, no miss anymore. I consider myself married to this orphanage and having all these children. So, anyone who tried miss never got a response. So, children learned that since that time, she was uh, Pani Stefa. And she was their mother. Uh, if you think of being a mother to one child, it's hard. Being a mother to 200 children, she managed. So I, I thought it would be important to show her and to acknowledge. 
So here, um, there's an interesting, I would recommend to read, there's an interesting article which he wrote, Knowledge Vis-a-vis -vis Practice. And he's talking about how he's learning from practice, which he's having with children, and what he's learning, and what kind of innovations he is bringing. I think, I think it's worth checking out. Uh, Korczyk, all his life, was a humble student of life. Would you relate to this? His whole life he was studying. How many teachers would say to the students, now you are my students, I'm your teacher. You listen to me, I know better. Kochik was exactly the opposite. He was learning from the kids, from other people, from life, from books. He was learning all the time and from his own experience. And that's one of the calls which came from him to the students. Every teacher, the moment the teacher stops self-development, that's the death of a teaching career for this person. So, um, I want to bring you to this book, which I mentioned several times, uh, When I'm Little Again. This is a famous book. It's published, you can find it on Amazon, it's easy, uh, it's not expensive. I strongly recommend to read it. I brought it to Gay, so it's published like this, with two books in one. When I'm Little Again and the Child's Right to Respect. And in this edition, it's on Amazon, you can get it. I want to read two things from this book because I, I started choosing what to read to you and I realized on every page I have my marks when I was reading so it would be impossible. So, let me read this. You remember the plot, right? The teacher overnight becomes a kid in his own school. And he comes to his school as, as a student. And he now feels his own teacher and the atmosphere of the school. And he kind of, he feels it from the other end. So he's talking about this. Uh, and we were talking about it with you. Like a teacher would come and um, kind of pat a child, put a hand on the head or on the shoulder or, or hug or... And he's saying, I don't like it when someone pets me or touches me. But now the teacher's hand felt cool and soft and I smiled. It's okay. Now about children's games. Uh, This is really one of the reasons why it's fun to play by yourself without grown-ups. The grown-up ahead of time tells how everything should be. Himself chooses who should be what and makes everyone hurry up as if he were here wasting his time. But he really doesn't know It's good to argue in a game, too. You can rest a little. Everyone gets together in a huddle and deliberates. It happens that someone gets hit or someone's clothes are torn, and then the whole blame is put on the one who was playing against the rules that were agreed upon ahead of time. It's your fault. And it goes on and on, and what he shows the game has its own space, its own time. Don't interrupt. The moment the adult brings his own rules into the game and starts it on the clock, we start, we finish, time over. There's no game in this. And one last thing I, I want to read, and I hope I give you enough impulses to read it yourselves. Now, when I'm a child, I think differently. A child ought to feel at ease when you look at him, you as an adult. And if you really want to say something to him, 
then it shouldn't appear as if it occurred to you accidentally, rather that you really want to tell this. And um, if you think for a second of yourself as a child, can you, can you remember anything from your children's perspective of the school? Do you want to share? Like, when you were a school student, in any way, anything which you would never relate to today, which is so strange to you that you felt like this, or, or, or how different it is in reality, but you believed it was like this for you when you were a child? So, so he was talking about three ways. Self-knowledge, self-education, and commitment to research. I was first kind of surprised the word self-knowledge. And then I thought, wow, that's really so important if you think about this. Until we know ourselves, like if this teacher knew she was napping, maybe she would <laughs> leave school or something else, or just do something about it. And uh, I'm not going to read all this because I will leave it with you, the PowerPoint, but I just want you to look through it. Be true to yourself. Have you ever tried to talk with yourself when no one is there and, and try seriously to tell <laughs> yourself how you feel, what you think, without any pretense? Could be brutal. But being true to yourself is easier to say than to do. But I think it's extremely important, especially for teachers who demand from kids exemplary behavior and exemplary attitude. So the question is how much we who demand can do it. Because if we can't, how can we demand from others? Only by definition, because we're teachers. How about rules of humanity and civility? So, self-education. This I love. The question is much more important than the answer. I think the moment the teacher stops asking questions of himself or to himself, that's the end of the career. Because if you think you know practically everything you need to teach, that's it. You need to leave the place. Commitment to research. That's another thing which many teachers don't realize. We're not just in the school building. We are in the clinic. We are in the lab. Whoever wants to stand up, it's okay, secret. Absolutely. Yeah. It's okay to stand up to you know use your muscles. Absolutely. Um, it's it's a research place because every student definitely is a new creature, right? With his or her new features which we need to learn. And in a way we are researchers. We're natural researchers. And the more we research, we, the more we understand their diversity, the better we are as teachers. And, and again, what you did. Teaching young teachers, this I love. We mentioned it. We, we had it one, uh, once on one card. Yes, yeah, somebody had it. Don't try to become a teacher overnight. Yeah. Oh, it's over there. Yeah, on the wall. Yeah. for an adult, the adult would be happy. <laughs> okay, good morning everyone. So far it has been an amazing summer institute, but the epicenter of this week is today. We have very, very special guests and I will come to it just in a second. Uh, we were talking about Janusz Korczyk in many different ways. 
as a person with his biography, as each of us has, and what he did and how he developed into what he became. We spoke about him as an educator, a psychologist, a researcher, and today we're mostly talking about him as a person who was by training a medical doctor, but who was also by passion an advocate for children. And today we are mostly concentrating on his medical part and his legal practice, which he would never call legal practice, but what he was doing, he was definitely doing child advocacy in its legal way, protecting children's rights. And we have here today incredible guests, and I want to say, uh, without looking at them, as if they're not here, uh, there are people in life, so I mean in my long life, I didn't say that, um, I met different people and some people you, you meet, you greet and you forget or you remember the face and next time you meet and it's okay, it's nice, but there are people who make a difference in your life who you can meet briefly and then you would remember them always, regardless of meeting them again or not, right? And I'm sure you met such people in your lives as well, not as long, but uh, probably among your students or your colleagues or your uh, professors. So meeting with uh, Gilles Julien and Delaine uh, Trudel, uh, this uh, humble couple sitting there, uh, that was life-changing for me, you know, and I was introduced to them by this humble person, uh, <laughs> Jerry Nussbaum, and when Jerry said, oh, you know, there's a symposium in Montreal on social pediatrics, are you interested? I said, sure, I am interested, but it was also, okay, I would love to go to Montreal again, it, it would be something... And then I came to Montreal and I learned what I learned about social pediatrics. And then what was most amazing, I heard two of them presenting. And then I heard uh, Judith Lenham, who is not here, but uh, this project reaches and Chris is here to present to you. And uh, I saw all those people who were so committed, like 400 we had at the time, yeah? And, and I thought, Gosh, I lived this long life. I never heard of social pediatrics. And then I started talking about social pediatrics in the United States with the people who consider themselves quite refined psychologists and educators and doctors, and no one heard of social pediatrics. And I thought, wow, something is not clicking something is not right and because of it it's so important for me here to have them as part of this summer institute and for you I'm sure all of you know but it's important to bring this word further it's important to bring something which the world doesn't know and finally learn so I put together a very short PowerPoint just a few slides concentrating on Korchuk as a medical doctor, because this is what's important in this situation. We spoke with you about different hats he was wearing, and the first hat, which was he was trained to be, that was the hat of a medical doctor. And all his life he felt like he was betraying medicine when he turned to actual education, to the orphanage. And here in this, I'm not going to read every quote, but he's talking about that the solution is not always to be found in books on psychology or medicine or anything, only bringing the whole Abundance of knowledge which exists in the world in different formats can make a solution right. But what is most important when we look down, we actually shared this experience with Chris. I was surprised she had the same. Many, many years ago when my students would go to the children's hospital to play with the kids in the playroom, there were medical students there who were taking notes, who were there for practicing, 
And uh, what my students noticed, and they were future teachers, they said, can you imagine they look up from their notes, the children wearing masks, children after chemotherapy, children without hair, children who look so desperate, all of a sudden these children smile and laugh. And they look at these children up, down to their notes, not a smile back. And uh, my response was, you know what, they need to look for another profession. Because if a pediatrician does not smile back when the child smiles, especially a sick child, gravely sick, then something is wrong professionally. This person doesn't belong to the field then. Then maybe this person would be a, a wonderful person professional, but somewhere else, working with books or machinery or equipment, not with little children. Uh, Korchuk wrote not only fiction, not only books for educators, he also wrote medical papers. And I brought you just two uh, titles here at the bottom. But he was kind of, some children considered it a little crazy why uh, we had to step on the scales. I do it every day. It terrifies me each time I'm getting on and anticipating what kind of weight I will see. But, uh, and stepping down is kind of a relief. For him, it was extremely important because if a child loses weight, that means something is wrong with the child's health. So this whole idea of checking physical health of a child was very, very important. And as we spoke before with you, it's really such a blessing to have someone as the head of the orphanage who combines two most important professions, a medical doctor and an educator then there's real care about a child. Because any passionate educator without knowledge of medical science could do something wrong without understanding the consequences of what is happening. Just not knowing. Because he knew that made it, the effect was really, really serious. I put here this long, long note, but the most important, that's again from Korchuk, the most important is, we were talking about it already, the symptoms when, which the medical doctor gets as the symptoms of some disease, there are other symptoms which are for an educator, the symptoms of bad behavior, something was wrong, something didn't go well. And again, in Korchuk, the synergy of this two works wonders. Because he could notice both a cough, nausea, pale face, vomiting, something else. And at the same time, he would notice the child is sad or the child is too excited, something, something goes wrong. Again, you can train yourselves uh, to notice this if you make an effort. But the effort should be there, right? I want to show you a couple of photos now. I didn't check with them whether I can or not, but because we have them published on the, on the journal, uh, I put it on canvas. I hope all of you saw it. The whole special issue of my journal, Russian American Education Forum, is about social pediatrics and mostly the papers from Gilles, Hélène, and uh, their colleagues. So these are the photos which uh, they sent to me to post in the journal. That was two years ago. Uh, I didn't ask the permission. I hope it's okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I want you to do is uh, a look at, well, Elian never sent her own picture. Well, no, 
Yeah, it's a usual thing. Well, um, so look how Gilles looks at the child. Look at the face. Um, I'm just wondering, is it really possible that every educator would start looking at children like this from, from below up? And with a smile like this, really accepting, embracing the child, regardless of what kind of child is that. I was, I was lucky to be invited to their center in Montreal. It's in a very humble neighborhood. But what they're doing there is so important, especially important as it is in the neighborhood where it is, where people really need this kind of services. And um, here, uh, Korczyk again is talking about the duration of the child's life. We're saying tomorrow you will be something and uh, Again, we spoke about it already. Children want to be adults. Have you ever thought why? A little girl wants to get on the heels of her mother and put lipstick and say, I am my mother, I am an adult, I'm taller. Why is that? Why they want to feel and look like adults and we they grow, uh, the, the more uh, we grow in age, we, the more we feel like it would be better to be a little younger, but oh well. So why do you think the kids want to be older, especially girls? Now actually I'm taking back, boys as well, yeah, boys as well. Why is that, Alice? They can do whatever they want to do. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Jacqueline? I totally agree. It's just wanting to have the right to do what they feel is in their heart to do. Okay. Anyone else? Claire? Being in charge of their own life. So, which means if we gave them that power, they wouldn't need to step into the high heels and put lipstick and pretend they're adults. But they feel they lack this power because we impose, because we think we know better. And apparently we don't. Apparently we make mistakes. And Korczyk is talking about the number, humongous number of mistakes adults make. I want to finish this with the motto of whole Korczyk's life. And we were talking about it, there are different translations. I'm here not to be loved and admired, but to love and take care of others. Again, I can only wish, I know it's absolutely not possible, but everyone in a helping profession field, if people start being really humble, just a little, and feel like we're not here in this world to be cherished, put on a throne or pedestal, being respected, admired for what we are. How about to step down, look up, and believe there are others who are better, who are stronger, who are smarter, and we are here to help them to thrive. When we're educators, we're helping our students to thrive and become, when we're doctors, we're helping our patients to become healthy or help them live whatever is given to them. We are in this helping field. In Russian, there's a verb, there's a difference in two verbs, which there's no difference in, in English. That is the verb to serve. So there's a verb which says to serve, meaning in its noble way, and there's a verb to serve, meaning kind of humiliating oneself. In English, we say serve. So using this first meaning of the verb serve, if we start serving people, 
without humiliating ourselves, but feeling proud that we are serving, I think the world would become a better place. Uh, with this note, I want to give the floor to these two people who definitely serve, underserved the population, that is children who really need more than what they get. So Gilles Julien, who is uh, a pediatrician and uh, a person who was awarded many different awards, I'm not going into this, but who was given a very special award, that is a Korczuk Association of Canada Award, and he has all the rights to be called a Korczuk of Canada, which, which is really, I think, a very special, special title. Hélène Trudel is uh, a no less incredible person who is a lawyer, and who does this legal part of the foundation of Dr. Julian and more. And, and she's a founder, help me, how is it called? Integrated law. Integrated law. And this whole idea about the circle of the child comes from her and the circles become so wide that they reached Vancouver and British Columbia and the whole Canada. So, two of you and uh, Miriam, who works in the same center and was helping with putting together the presentations and works in the same field.